So you may proceed when you're ready. Um, thank you. Welcome back, Mr. Sabali. Thank you. Uh, may I remind you that you are still on the oath Correct. and you are expected to be 100% truthful in your testimony. Correct. Uh, before the break, we were talking about the kinds of torture that was meted out on you. Uh, you indicated uh, that there was an instance the first one was when your when a plastic bag was put over your head Piccadilly plastic bag correct and uh, your head is being soaked in and out of a bucket containing liquid uh, of a mixture of uh, acid uh, well, it was acidic, acidic. Uh, but contained gasoline, water, and, uh, and, and, and other liquids. Correct. The second instance is uh, when you were taken to the beach and your head is, was being dipped in and out of the, of the, of the sea uh, until you completely blacked out. Uh, and the third is... Uh, Point of correction, please. The beach is not only the head, but the complete body was immersed in water. Your complete body was immersed in water. Correct. Uh, you are being dipped in and out, out. until you pass down. Correct. Uh, thank you for that correction, Mr. Sabali. Uh, you also indicate uh, that um, you were buried alive almost on three different occasions. Correct. Uh, you also said that uh, in some of the tortures, Manlafikor wielded a hammer, and that hammer was used all over your body. Correct. Um, and you indicated that you've been tortured over 20 times. And right. throughout, during those periods, Elijah Martin, called Lagos, was the head of the torturers. Correct. Or was the head of the torture team. Uh, you also indicated members of the torture team. Um, you also indicated a fourth torture, fourth type of torture, uh, which is when you are being forced to eat. Uh, yes. Correct. Uh, so uh, now let's proceed. Have you, have you ever, well, what other means of torture were also used against you? Can I say something quickly? Please, please go ahead. Uh, this torture was intensified in the first two months of my arrest before the visit of the IRC, ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross. That's right. So we want to, we want to have the full spectrum okay. of the various types of torture that were meted on you. We also want to know their effect on you and other people, uh, their impact and all that. So proceed now with uh, uh, your testimony regarding the other types of torture that was meted out on you. 
another time they came in, they came with uh, a long bag. It's called um, this San Kilo bag, this long one. This groundnut bag, I will call it for all of us to understand the type of bag I'm referring to. And then when they came, they tied my legs, tied my hands, and then they put me inside this bag. And then I was hung up in the air on the ceiling, and then this bag was swinging left and right, front and back. And I was head down. How did it feel? It's like um, I was a ping pong ball. When they soft me to the left, Malafi soft me back. Like Martin soft me with a through back to Malafi, and it was like that going and coming, going and coming. How did it feel to you? Dizzy, completely. My blood completely came on my head, and I swooned at one point. You passed out completely. And throughout this period, what was their objective? I believe they wanted to break my spirit completely. One, in that I would lie because they had always come with a tape recorder. And later I come to understand they had always recorded these incidents and they had shown it through Yama. Recorded how? Video? <coughs> Video again, but that one I cannot confirm. But the tape recorder was always there. So apart from being hung, up the ceiling, uh, you know, with your head down in a in a in a in a groundnut bag uh, or sack, so to say. Uh, what else did they do to you? <coughs> Can you tell us about the short circles? Uh. Okay. This were some of the moments when they would come with a uh, electric machine, and I'll, they had electrocuted me. They would apply one of the electrodes on my neck, oh, sorry, on in my tongue, and then the other on my penis, and they would be adding the voltage slowly, slowly, voltage high and voltage down. And this all were accompanied with beatings. And, yeah. They electrocuted you? Okay, now. On your penis and on, on your penis tongue? my penis and my tongue. Who did that? Alaji Martin, on Lamin Senghor. Where did this happen? This happened in mile two for the first time. Then the second time, they took me to the NIA headquarters. And at the NIA headquarters, who did it? This I cannot tell exactly who were, but there was one name I heard clearly was Dabo, but I don't know his first name, but they used to call him Dabo, 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 Dabo. Yeah. On this particular occasion, was exactly. Alaji Martin there? Yeah, he had always come for me. For tortures, he was always there. He was never absent. Lamin Senghor? Lamin Senghor was always there. PM Sar? PM Sar, as I said, he had never touched me physically, but he was always standing by. Manlafi? Manlafi, yeah. He was also there. Ndur? Nur also was there, these are TSG personnel. Bach Sambaba? Bach hardly comes every day. His comments were not oft. Babakar Bob? Babakar Bob, Bob also was not always. So, you said this electrocution was done together with beatings. Exactly. Can you describe the beatings? What would they use against you? As I said, Malafi had always come with this warranty claw hammer. And for him, this was the weapon he had always used on me. And that's why I lost my distort on the left hand side here.
And apart from this electrocution, did they use another method of torture on you? Correct. This was another time when they came, as I said, I was always naked completely, like a needle. And they took me out first. Then they brought uh, Sadibu, he was in the prisons, and uh, in confinement number five. And there in the corridor, they let us down first. And then they took a pin, long pin, this was iron. And then they drove it right inside my penis. And then the same thing was done to Sadibu, right in my presence. And whilst they made the same thing to me, he was standing, watching. And the other day they came, for the first time in my life, I come to know what a G-string is. They brought two, they asked me to wear it by force. And then they did the same thing to Sadibu. They said we should pose as prostitutes, so to say, in their town. And along the line, they said, I should, with Sadibu Hydra, we should make homosexual actions, meaning I should have sex with Sadibu Hydra. And I refuse, or have you refused? Yeah, they beat us to death, so to say. Who did that? Elijah Martin, Lamin Senghor, Ndur, Malafikor, on this particular occasion. When you said they beat us to death, what do you mean? As always, Malafi had his claw warranty hammer, and then they used the butt of the AK-47 to bust us. Do you know what was it that was used to be inserted in your penis? I think it would be the small iron in a bicycle. It looked like that, not exactly. In a bicycle, the spoke. Okay, now the spokes of a bicycle, but it is not that exactly. But it looks like that. How did it feel? Terribly painful, and that's why I they ruptured my bladder. How did these people react? When you were agonizing, when you were in pain, how did they react? Unless I go black out, they never stop. Or when other when Malafikor had played the good cop, then they limit it and then start again. Because then they would ask if I have to talk. When I don't, then it continues again. Who asks the questions? It is always Alaji Martin, who directs the questions to be asked. And Lamin Senghor was always asking. And Malafi Kaur was the good cop. Uh, 
Apart from this type of torture, what other method did they use on you? I want to come to the, but I would want here to mention I had two ladies with me in the residence. These two ladies, when I got arrested, they were picked up, but not at mile two. They were taken to NI headquarters for two months. It was when I discharged from the prisons, they got to tell me all the ordeals they underwent at the NI headquarters. These two ladies were very close to me. They were taken to the NI headquarters, according to them. They were stripped completely naked. And at the NI headquarters, bananas were used, sticks were used as dildos right into their womanhoods. I'm sorry for the language. And they have been told, you will never have a man inside you anymore because we will destroy your womanhood. And this continued for two good months before they were eventually released. I learned from them the person they could identify was one Baba Drame. Did they say anything about the questions they were asked at NIA? They were asked if I had told them anything of my plans or would be plans to get rid of Yaya. And they were asked also to confirm what statements they were going to say in the event they were brought before me. And once that was done, while they tortured them, I was brought in and I stood and I watched how they were being tortured. You mean that you were taken from mile two? Exactly. Brought to NIA? Exactly. And made you watch? Exactly. While these two women exactly. who were close to you were being tortured? Tortured, exactly. Who did that? This, the NIA headquarters personnel, I don't know them exactly. But as I said, one person I could remember was called Dabo, but I don't know him in person. But this name I kept in my brain since then. And uh, what kind of torture did you see? At this particular time, this, on this issue, on this day, as I said, they had used bananas and dildos inside their womanhoods. And who was administering this gruesome process? This was this double I'm talking about. As this was being done, were you being asked questions? Nay, at this particular point, nay, they didn't ask me questions, but later they moved me into another room where they asked me to sign the statement that I wanted to kill Jame. If not, they will bring these ladies and they will kill them in my presence. Did you sign? I didn't sign anything. You still refused? I still refused, yeah, correct. They still can't break you? Nay. How about Haidara? Haidara was also the same thing. But in, on this particular day at the headquarters, at the, uh, my headquarters, Haidara was not there. Do you, can you give us a description of this Dabo? He's a tall guy, tall, slanky somebody. If I could remember, the, the intonation is either from Gunjur, Sukuta, or Sanyang. This is the Mandinka dialect there. Um, thank you very much for that. But apart from this Dabo, you could not I, recall I anybody. Any other person, no. Do you recall who, who, who escorted you from Mile 2 to NIA on this it's occasion? Elijah Martin's team always had come for me. If I have to leave Mile 2 for tortures. Uh, could you kindly remove your hands from your mouth so we can hear you clearly? I know this is very difficult. Uh, we crave your indulgence. It is important that we bring things out so that the Gambian people would know some of the things that Gambians have done on other Gambians. Uh, it is absolutely important. Uh, I am terribly sorry. Um, so, on this occasion, was it just Alaji Martin or was it the entire team? Alaji Martin was there, Malafikor was there, Lance Kapal Senghor and Ndur was, th was there. And uh, these women were kept at NIA for two months, Two you months, said. according to their information they gave me. But you confirmed seeing them at the NIA when this process of e torture was being meted out on them? Exactly. 
How did it feel seeing these two women close to you being treated in such a barbaric manner? Horrific. Yeah. If perhaps if they were military personnel, what could under, I could understand? Military personnel do not deserve to be tortured. Nee, what I mean is probably is that uh, they could have undergone a training where they could receive some of these things, I mean. Nobody deserves to be tortured. Okay. Nobody. Apart from this method of torture, what other method did they use on you? Another time they brought in this, um, I don't know where they got it, but if one is from the villages, if you had a sweater on, mostly you walk into the bush, these close footpaths, the seeds come attached to you. It has thorns. Thorns, thorns exactly, correct. Thank you for the word. And this fire spread on the wall, sorry, on the floor, and this was in the NIA headquarters. And then we were naked, me and Sadibu. They dragged us on these thorns, yeah, ages. And what happened when your body came into contact with these stones? Lacerations, we sustained lacerations, and they poured cold water, ice water on us. For how long did this happen? As long as I can remember, we were there in the morning, and when we came, I found my lunch in the cells. So this could be around 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Were you conscious throughout, or you yeah, When they brought out? me back this summer, I was conscious. And who participated in this incident? This is Alaji Martin, Lance Kapil, Senghor, Ndur, and Malafikor. As I said, private PM Sar had never laid hands on me. How would you describe these people, Alaji Martin, Lance Corporal Senghor, and Ndur, and Bob, how would you describe them? Well, wait, they are torturers, that's all. Your word is, they are they what? They are torturers. Torturers, that's what you said. Mm -hmm. What do you say to the suggestion that you were never tortured, they just asked you questions? What that do you say to that? That is totally false. That is totally false. Do you know what is called waterboarding? Right. Have you ever experienced it? Yeah. I think I would I'd prefer if you would only read it, please. It's all right. I would, I would skip it. But can you confirm to us that you experienced it? Yeah, many times. Who did it to you? Elijah Martin and his team, Malavikor, Danskabur Senghor, and Ndur. Uh, if you don't mind, okay. I can read out an excerpt from your statement. Please. If, if, only if you don't mind. I agree. Um, you had this to say, and I quote, On this session, we were told it was, it's a washing day, an order from the president. Quote, Take them to their washing, unquote. As if we were circumcised, initiated children to take their first bath after one month in the bush or woods. This was around 3 to 5 a.m., I calculated, or knew from the early morning bird singing. We were taken to the sea just across the highway, directly in front of the prisons. Correct. We were in our usual torture sessions uniform, in brackets, but they shoot, that is, stark naked. And, cons and costume jewelry, that is, sackles and handcuffs. Right. The air was very cold and windy. The seawater was near freezing point. By the Besa intelligence interrogation methods called waterboarding, 
they strapped us down and pushing us under the water until we were made to believe one might drown. We had been in this way on and on, held under water until we had in fact begun to drown and lost consciousness, only to be revived by our torturers and submerged again. It was one of our worst memories and experiences. That's what you said. Correct, 100% correct. Who did this to you? Alaji Martin, Alaji Kor, Ndur, Unlanska Pulisangor. You were also subjected to the water pit treatment. In your statement, you said as follows. There was the water pit in which most communal cell blocks in the jail that is housing the criminal convicts empty their waste matter. Also thrown into this pit was every type of conceivable dirt. We are made to stand on tiptoe to avoid drowning. Who did this to you? This is Alaji Martin, Lanskapur Sengor, Malafikor, Undur. Other sessions, we were left gagged with our hands tied on the top of our cell door after being questioned by the NIA and the close bodyguards or soldiers to the president. Who are you referring to? Which bodyguards or soldiers to the president? This was the time Khalifa Bajinka took part in this session with Musa Jamme plus Alaji Martin and his team. You went on to say that at one location you were blindfolded and hooded and kept in scorching hot sipping containers. Right. Uh, we, we, we went through that. Okay. You also described that on one occasion you were chained for a week. Exactly. There I would explain, in the cell, in confinement number one, cell number four, both ends of the room, this room is 2.25 meters long, 2.5 meters, the width and length is almost the same, maybe the height would be three meters. And as I said, on the head, long, head side is a raised bankman, and the, at the foot end also is the same thing, maybe 50 meters, sorry, 50 centimeters high. And this is where normally the plank of wood as a bed is laid upon. But they are the dog in the wall, and then they put an iron bar there. And on the foot side also, they put the same iron bar. And the plank of wood was removed. And I was tied in my handcuff. And the, on the cups, uh, bed side, sorry, in the head side, I was chained. And then in the left side, on the feet side, I was chained and I was hanging there. And this was the time I was left there for that long. No wooden plank under your body. Nah. You are forced to suspend pretty exactly. much. How did it feel? Yeah. My tendons were all completely, yeah. Up to now, you would not talk? Nah. I never gave in. Up to the day I left prison, I never gave in. Another time, tell us about the efforts to insert certain things in your body. Would you be willing to talk about that? Yeah. Tell us. This was also another day. They put an iron inside my anus and I was hanging by my hands on the ceiling. But barely my feet touches the ground, and since the, my weight, whole body weight, was on my wrist, if I tried to move, it was like I would be impaled by the iron inside my anus. Who did that to you? Alaji Martin, 
lan ko pour sengor man la fi kor andour what do you mean by impelled i know the word i know the meaning yeah this was like if i bring my weight down on my feet it picks me right inside my anus so i am forced to stay exactly where i am on my wrist at the sling like this and being impaled m- means that the stick or the metal rod would pierce through your body exactly. and come out from your head is what if you were to come fall down, down directly into uh, onto that, uh, that 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 rod exactly how about castration do you hear anything about that do you know anything about that yeah this was a repetition of what they asked us to do that means i have to have sex with sadhu hydra and sadhu with me and since we refused they said since we refuse they said okay then we will castrate you since you don't want to have sex together with each other and this was the time they started with hydra they forced him down on the ground they put an iron bar under his testicles and maleficor took the claw pen warranting hammer and then they forced bit the muscles on the testicles or inside the testicles and i am not a doctor at the time i am not a medical personnel at the time but if you we were today i would definitely say the cause of sadhu's death was from that because thereafter he bled up to the day he died nostrils ears anus penis everything was blood who did that to him this is alaji martin landscapul sengor lafikor andur your testimony is that sadi would died from this torture i would say that who killed him this would be from this tortures um uh, lafikor landscapul sengor alaji martin andur your testimony is that your testimony is that sadibu haidara was murdered by manlafikor alaji martin alias lagos lamin senor correct let me i have here a copy of the investigative report uh that was done by the NIA okay uh it is part of the documents we received from the NIA and it says the caption is investigation report mm-hmm. i am passing a photocopy to the chairman and i'll be reading from the original it says investigation report okay. on the on the sudden death of captain sadi bo haidara okay. would you agree to that headline no totally not and it went on to say as follows on saturday 3rd june 1995 captain sadi bo haidara a former minister of the interior and member of the afprc who on friday 27th uh, january 1995 was detained at mile 2 prisons along with 26 others mm-hmm. for their alleged attempt on the life of AFR, OFPRC chairman and head of state captain Yahya AJJ Jame in an attempt to seize power okay. died in his cell in the remaining wing at mile 2 the aim of the report 
is to highlight the outcome of the investigations into the sudden death of Saadi Buhaydara. And uh, the case history suggests that the late ex-captain Saadi Buhaydara met his death on Saturday, 3rd June 95, while in his cell at the Riman wing due to an illness. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says, according to the investigations, the late Sadibu, for the past years, had been complaining of hypertension. During his dissension too, he complained of fever and revealed he was a hypertension patient. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I have many points of correction on this information. One, Sadibu <coughs> never, never complained of any high blood issues. Two, he w didn't die at the remind wing in the state central prison. He died in security wing number one, in cell number nine, exactly at 1600 hours 17, in my hands. Let me read out the findings of the report. And he died on, on the 6th, not on the 3rd. Thank you very much for that. Uh, how come you still recall this date? This date, I will never forget it in my life. Yeah. The findings of the report. It says as follows. A thorough investigation was made to find out about Sadi Haidara's death. There is no evidence of foul play being detected, and during the post-mortem, he was found, found to be well-built, well-nourished, and no external signs of injury was detected too. He was just found to have had oedema hypertension and, mul and multiple liver problems. The results of the post-mortem exercise have specified the cause of death. Conclusion, Sadibu Haidara is therefore deemed to have died on a natural death while in detention at Rimain Wing in mile two. Signed by investigative officers J.B. Mendy mm. and Fodebari. Okay. Is this report true? It's totally false. It's a fabrication. For me, if the doctor who made the post-mortem wrote this information to, to these two officers, his licensing to operate as a medical personnel should have been revoked immediately. It's a cover-up. Exactly. Sadibu died in my hands 1600 hours 17 on the 6th of June. Thank or the 3rd, which, which one? It's not on the 3rd, it's on the 6th. We prayed 2 o'clock prayers. We were waiting for 5 o'clock prayers. I and LF Jame were playing Scrabble and Sadibu went back into his cell and laid down. And then he called me. I came and he was lying down on his back and he said, help me, I'm seeing my grandmother. I said to him, yeah, you are seeing your grandmother, but you are in mile to here. Do not worry, we'll go out of this place alive. And all of a sudden, I saw the eyes were changing, and I knew he was nearing his death. But still, I kept with him. And then he asked me, what do you do with people who didn't understand where you stand for them? Meaning the council members who betrayed us. And he told me, there's a, um, a verse in the Holy Quran which deals with forgiveness. Let us forgive them. And then he asked me to read Satul Yasin for him, and we did. I did rather. And then I called Babu Karanjai, I called Ablai Bojang, he was a prison officer, he was a sergeant who was in charge of us. Then I called the two, and then they came. I, to I told them, help me to lay him down properly on his back. And we laid him properly on his back. And I asked Njai to go out and Ablai Bojan to go out. And I stayed with him. 
until he breathed his last. Exactly 1600 hours 17, on the 6th of June. You did not forget? No. Even a second in that time? No. Because immediately he passed out, he, he closed his eyes. I closed his eyes, I asked Guy to tell me the time. And he told me exactly it was 1600 hours 17. You did not want to forget that time? No, in, I can't ever, forget that life. time. I can't. Sadhu is part of me. And he will ever remain to be part of me. Yes, um, I mean, if your wife wants to come and assist, she can. Feel no, it's free. okay. I can carry on. It's okay. Thank you. I can carry on. Now I come back to my own yes. frustration. Yes. When Sadi passed out in these tortures, I'm not talking about his death now, but I did. Yes, at the time session. of the torture. Exactly. Yes. They were confused, but they never stopped. And then they put him aside. And then I was brought in, forced on the ground. They put the same iron bar under my testicles. And Malif came with his hammer again. And he started beating the muscles that joins the testicles and the other sexual organs within the body. I think at one point I also got blackout, pass out. And since the day on until I discharge, we got no medical attention. When I left the prisons, my fear came true that I had sexual dysfunction from these tortures. Of course, I underwent through medical treatment, medical treatment for all these years, and thank God, it has completely not healed, but better. They attempted to castrate you? Exactly. Uh, Mr. Sabali, how do you feel that you've gone through all these types of torture in the hands of your former colleagues and your brothers in force, your brothers in arms. How I do felt, you feel? I felt betrayed in as much as I had done nothing. The accusation in, uh, in quotation, yeah, I felt betrayed <coughs> completely. We have had testimony that this was poetic justice. You had tortured people. Okay. It was your turn to be tortured. Exactly. That is the way it goes. Exactly. What goes around what, comes around. Or what <laughs> exactly. Okay. What do you say to that? Correct. Do you regret the tortures that you meted out on other people? I do. Wholeheartedly. I wish I knew at the time what I know today and what I learned in the prisons, I wish I had known it before, meaning in the prisons, as I always say, is the last university for me in the world. I had learned wisdom, humility, patience and understanding. And that's why I came out of the prison, not bitter, but better. And I had forgiven all of them. Uh, that is deeply profound. You came out not bitter, no. but better. Exactly. Deeply profound. Do you, what do you harbor in your heart for those people who meted out this gruesome torture on you? I had nothing against them. For Malafikor, we saw in the prison before I discharged, 
At one point he came, I think he fell out with Jame and he was sent out of the state house back to Fajara Barracks. And once he came with uh, Lieutenant Combo, Combo, and when Combo came, normally he must come with an escort. Out of curiosity, I asked, Wait, where are your escorts? He said, it's your class, meaning Malafi Court. I said, where is he? He said, he's at cell number four. And then I said, why not you call him to come in? And then he went and forced him to come. And when he came, I said, but why didn't you come to our cell number one when you are the escort to come, Lieutenant Combo? He stood down. I said, we know each other from the training. What you have meted on me, I knew you don't done it alone, you were sent. But you have done your bit, I have forgiven you. And since then, yeah, why not we became good friends. The time he came, we talked. And it was along this line that he revealed most of these things that whenever they were torturing me beside the tape recorder, they had filmed it on video. And they had shown it to Jame to watch. But as I said, this part I cannot confirm. What happened to my man Lafikor ultimately? I don't know where he is exactly. He's dead. Oh, oh. May God you never have, have mercy nee, May God have mercy on his soul. I never had his death. Oh, yeah. What do you feel about Alaji Martin? I, if I see him also, I would forgive him. I have nothing against them. Absolutely nothing. Even Jame, as I said, when I left the prison, the day I left the prison, right at the main gate, I had said it clearly. I have forgiven him. But your ordeal did not stop after your conviction. Yeah, clear. It will not stop. I knew it would not stop. But I don't have to live in that situation. I have to find a better future. Well, tell us about the attempts to have you poisoned. Okay. This was um, the last six months before I discharged from prison. Actually, the, the timing ranges for two, and a half, two, point three, two years, three months. It all came about, I was sentenced for nine years, and normally as a citizen of the country, and a convict, I was supposed to be given a parole after having served six years, nine months, meaning three quarter of the sentence. And this was supposed to be September, 2001, October or September, I can't recall exactly, but if we calculate six years, nine months, it will take us around August or September or October 2001. I was not relieved. I went to David Coley. I told him that day David Coley, he wept. He showed me that it was not him and I confirm. He showed me the letter he wrote to the Minister of Interior, asked him for my release. But the Minister of Interior, of course, they also couldn't do anything. They wrote back that I was not going to be released. And I told David Coley on the face, I said, me I knew, this remaining two years, three months, I will serve it to the end. Meaning I have to serve the whole nine years completely to the end. But I made it clear to him, in the, I will not die in the prisons. I will go alive. This I knew. And I told him also to give me a new uniform, the prison uniform. I insisted until he gave me two pairs. Where, in which part of the prison did you serve your term? In security number one, cell number four. Not even general convicts? No, I was throughout in that one man cell for nine good years. Most of the time wearing what? In my but they should completely naked. And for most of the time, they had poured water in the cell, and I would be on that concrete floor with water. Tell us about the attempt to poison you. OK. It went up to the last six months before my discharge. The first attempt, I believe, was to put me in another charge to extend my prison term. And this was done by one Yaya Jaju. At the time, he was a superintendent. Because he used to tell me, they named Yaya Jame after me. But his name also was Yaya. He come from, I believe, Faraba Bantang. But for me, that was not important. And as I say, I would say, in the prison, the diet, the food, 
we have two types of food in the prisons. One is the general diet, meaning GD, and the other one is the high protein we call HP. This general diet was for everybody in the prison. If anyone was to be given this HP, the high protein, you must have gone to the hospital and a doctor would have prescribed this particular food for you. And in, throughout my stay in the prisons, for the past eight years, six months, I never thought to have that opportunity. And I was never sick where I went to a doctor, and the doctor prescribed such a particular food for me. And knowing my relationship with this particular area, this superintendent, I never expected such a gesture also from him. From nowhere, out of the blue, one day he came smiling with a small piece of paper. He came, I was in the cells, and he knocked, they opened the door, and he said, ah, today you are promoted. But that's the term we use in the prison, meaning you have graduated from the general diet to the high protein. What it means, the difference is only that the, the general diet, this is the general cooking for everybody in the prisons. So this HP, why they call it HP is only that it contains more vegetables. And f maybe if you have to have a fish, it will be a whole fish. If it has to be meat, probably also maybe three, four, five pieces of meat. That's the only difference. Fine. When he came with this piece of paper, small paper, he said, Sabali, today you are promoted. For me, what was it? I was still in the prison. And then he said, today, from today, you will get the high protein diet. And you will get two basins, meaning my lunch, my dinner would be the same. I only said to him, thank you. But for me right now, my brain has started working. One, as I said, I was never before a doctor for that particular doctor to prescribe such a food for me. And I knew this particular yaya would never, on his own accord, give me that chance to have that particular food in the prison. Never. So I knew something was amiss. I prepared myself psychologically, but what it was, I could not tell and I cannot tell. We were there. They started bringing the food. It came normal. Every day, two basins, apart from the breakfast. I will eat. The other basin I will give to Suleiman Sar. This Suleiman Sar was the one who was involved in the Farafenya attack. And it went on, went on, until one day, my suspicion became true. In the prison at the time, we have the chief cook, who was Jerry Kuli. We have the assistant chief cook, who was also Kuli. I forgot his name. Where are these colleagues from? Uh, they are from Kasamas. They are not Gambia? No, nee, they were serving jail terms also. Ah, okay. The, 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 the second the chief cook was Gere Kuli. The second one was uh, Salif Kuli. Gere and Salif. Okay. My wife's surname is Kuli. So I built a good rapport with the two of them, even before this incident. Meaning to change my diet from general diet to high P, high protein. And Salif Kuli, the deputy chief cook, was responsible for cooking and dishing out this HP, this high protein. And as I said, he used to bring this food to me. And when he didn't come, it was Harbabu, he was serving life sentence, he used to come. And in the prisons, we have a helper at the infirmary, at the clinic. Ablaiba, he was serving a life sentence. There are two Ablaibas, they were all serving life sentence, but I hear I mean the younger one. One day, Salif Koli came, brought my food. I was playing Scrabble with Elif Jame. And normally when they come with my food, I would most of them, if they found us doing something like playing draft or playing Scrabble, or doing nothing but we are sing, sitting outside during break periods, they will take the two basins and put it inside my cell on the table. Actually, this table was just a cement slab. Now, on this particular day, 
Salif came with these two basins and then went inside my cell and stood instead of putting the basin down and come out as usual. So he called Alolom in Jola, meaning my in-law. My Yola has come back now. Now um, he, he called me Alolom. I say, yeah. Joe, come in Jola. I was playing Scrabble. I didn't go. I told him, put it down on the table where you used to put it. So he was still standing there. Then he called again, Alolom, Joe. So LF said, Wulieta. Maybe I could defend the camera in Mandinka. Reluctantly, I woke up, I got up, I went. But then the officer who escorted them followed behind me immediately. And as soon as I entered my cell, he told me in Jola, Tamburi Sinyangas, meaning, do not eat this food today. I don't know what was the reason. So I said, okay, and he left with the, with the officer who was escorting them. So the two basins were standing there. Since the others have their food, I ate from their basins. In the evening, the, the morning chief had gone home. In the evening, they brought our dinner. Mine was already in the cell. As I said, I had two basins every day. My lunch and dinner comes together. When they brought the other basins for the other detainees there, or the other convicts, Harbabu came and Ablai so this younger Ablai so who was a helper at the infirmary. Normally in the evening, he brings medication for prisoners who were in the security wing to take their evening doses. And when he came, Salif had told him, go and tell my in-law that in the food, there was something Yaya had put inside your food. How it happened, later he explained to me, him, he himself, that whenever they wanted to put something inside, Yaya would tell him, if you finish cooking before you take the basin to Sana, bring them to my office. Which Yaya? This is Yaya Jaju, the superintendent in the prison service. Proceed. And he would take these two basins to Yaya at his office. And if you would know where this building is in the prisons, it is, it has just behind you, it's glass doors. Anybody who stands outside can see somebody right inside. And then Salif said he stood and watching. But he don't know what Yaya put inside the food, into these two basins, but he knew he put something inside these two basins. And then he would call him inside, and he, Salif would enter the office and take these two basins and bring them to me. And he had told Salif, who never mentioned it because he had asked him, did you see anything? No. Okay. And it continued like that. So each time Salif took this basin to the superintendent, Yaya Yaju, Salif would make sure that he sent me a message. But also, he would make sure that he sent another basin under Suleiman Sar's name, which is also a high protein, but not a full basin. Meaning he could give it to Suleiman Sar as a gift, but this was meant for me. And when these two basins were all brought to me, in the prisons is a law. When the prisoner refused to eat his food or her food, they would record and take it to the headquarters. So all along, I also played along the line. When the two basins were brought and I was informed that they had, yeah, I had put something inside, I would take these two basins, dip my hand in both these two basins for the lunch one, and the dinner one also I would do the same thing as if somebody had eaten from these two basins and put it in my camber pot, meaning where I make my pee-pee. Now, in the morning, when they come, they will look at the two basins and see that it's like, oh, he has eaten. But I never ate from those two basins. What do you say was the effect of the conduct of Koli? David Koli or Wick Koli, sorry. The cook. He informed me. He saved your life, didn't exactly. he? Exactly. And I would come to that what also I did when I left, left prison. Uh, what other F attempt was made on your life while you were in prison? Um, this were the moments when they would torture me and then they would send the information outside 
that Sanahat hit his head on the wall. Actually, they would have done, they would do that, but the information will go out as a rumor that Sana has hit his head on the wall and he has broken his head. How about the injections? This would come on the 29th of August, 2003. Tell us about it. This was from James, couple James, but the one who administered this injection was Farmer Asane. He was, before coming to the prison department, he was at the army. He was at which army? The Gambia National Army. What's his full name? Farmer Asane. And what did he do to you? Um, this time I had malaria. And for two weeks I was laid low by malaria. I was never taken to the hospital or attended to. And one fine afternoon or in the evening, first came James, this James Jadu. They were both working in the infirmary in the prison, central prison. James came, he asked, I said, yes, I had malaria. I was still lying down on the bed. And then he went back. The next, the two of them came, and Farmer came with a syringe and needle. Before I could realize anything, chuck on my left eye. And up till today, this pain is there, and I have my legs. The right is longer than the left one. From that injection? From that injection. Do you know what they injected in you? No, I don't know. I can tell. For me, my fear factor was one. And we are fine. This might have been fancy in my brain. Maybe they injected me with AIDS, nobody knows. Hepatitis, nobody knows. Things like that were reeling in my mind. Or a po de deadly poison that could eat in me eventually when I had to leave the prisons, maybe a month or two, I could die. And it would have been seen as a natural death. Were you able to walk after this injection? Nay, for two good months, I was not able to walk. Do you know what information went out of the prison concerning your leg? That I was paralyzed. How do you know that? My family members told me, in fact, one of my aunties who was here right now, but she's gone home, could have attested to that. And David Colley also could attest to that. Farmer Colley also could attest to that. He was uh, an SPO at the time. And uh, Balajo, I forgot his name, but he was also an SPO. I go into this one quickly. This particular day, it was around four, between four and five. The morning duties had ended their tour of duty, and the afternoon duties were there. And then Ablai Bojan came quickly and said, dress in, dress up, you have a visitor. I said, okay. You can't take me like that without telling me who I'm going to visit. Because at this time I had no visit. Why did you have to dress up? I had to go to the headquarters. Yes, but why did you have to dress up? You didn't have any clothes on? No. You were always naked? Yeah, in this particular point I was naked. Then he threw the uniform on me. Of course, between Abla and me, this is a Jola and Fula. And then I dressed up. He took me to the headquarters. And when I arrived at the headquarters, my auntie was standing, but her back towards me. And she was there quarreling or trying to find out with Balajo, sorry, uh, with Farmer Kuli. Because Balajo and Farmer Kuli, they look alike. They are all short and the same prison uniform. So for her, as she later told me, was that she told Balajo, or David Kuli told Balajo, go and bring Sana. And Balajo came in. So all of a sudden, she was facing the headquarters and Farmer Kuli came from the other end. So for her, it was like Balajo went this other side of the confinement and come out from the other door, was trying to avoid her. And then she told her, she told him, Mbarin kere fanang, ikoi bitan dingo kamala imanat, saika borin na munela. And it was like, nen tente, ifangolom tente, ifangolom. Then I arrived with her, Balajo and Ablai Bojan. Then when I arrived from her back, I hooked her from the rear. And then she turned, then she said, Yarebe Balurin in Fula, they get a worry. I told him in Fula, Hoko. Then she told me, I'm just having lunch, and a lady come, a lady friend of mine come and said, They have just buried you at uh, Joshuang Cemetery. And I said, But who told you? They said, It's my friend. I said, Your friend told you that? Yes. And I told her, If I have to die here, you will know about it. Here I will leave this prison alive. And then she, went, she left for home. 
Um, Mr. Sabali, I have no further questions for you, uh, but uh, I'll, allow, I'll yield the floor to the commissioners to ask whatever questions they have. And uh, thereafter, you'd be given an opportunity to address the Gambian people. I would prefer that you do it in local languages. Speak Wolof and, or, or no Fula. We have had you in Mandinka yesterday. And this is just for listeners who do not understand English to be able to hear you at all aspects of your testimony in their own languages. But can I, the choice is yours. If, if I have the permission, can I say something quickly? It's just Please, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I don't know how far we're we going to sit again to continue, but uh, I want to make a correction here. Um, we're all Gambians. I have no problem with any journalist, but lies have been paraded and is on, on endless... Okay, sorry, I'm talking Dutch now. Endlessly, lies have been paraded. And I would like to make a clarification. Omar Ba was a journalist here in the Gambia. When I discharged from the prison, he was not the first journalist who interviewed me. Correction. It was Sirif Bojan Junior who interviewed me right at the main gate of the prison when I stepped out. One. Two, he just wrote not long ago that Anti Adler Sosa here was the one who harbored me, gave me housing, and yeah, you could find this information in the internet. I am saying I am not ungrateful to anybody. I will not deny knowing Auntie Adelaide Sose, like any other person here, but she never knew where I was. We never saw when I left the prisons. Not Auntie Adelaide, not her daughter, later of her Sose. I am asking, please, if we have to give any information as far as this 3RRC is concerned, let us give the real truth to the Gambian people. No more lies. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, your witness. Thank you very much, Council, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Savali, uh, for your candor and uh, for your testimony. Um, Commissioner Sam, if you have any questions, please indicate. <clears throat> yes, I'm, uh, Commissioner Carr, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I have uh, some questions. The first is, I'm interested to know how you came up with the decrease um, during the transition period. Sorry, can you repeat that, please? The decrease, the military decrease. Okay. And what if you played any role in that? Okay. I am not a legal-minded person, but we employed the services of our Justice Minister at the time, Fafa Idris Sambai. He guided us through this process. The second question is, um, when you initially came into power, you faced a lot of opposition from the international community. How were you able to deal with that? I am most grateful that you come up with this question. And here, I think we would, if you look at the negative part, we should also look at the positive part of our council at the time. Uh, with the international community, we really had help with them. At one point, the diplomacy didn't work. Personally, it didn't work. And one time I was in Sierra Leone, they gave me a call and said, oh, we are in we run into trouble with the diplomatic community. They have given a travel advice, meaning they banned their citizens from coming to the Gambia. I said, okay. I cancel my trip, I come home. Lokila Arafia, I think in the afternoon before three o'clock. I convene a meeting of the American ambassador, uh, James Molly Scott, who was the dean of the diplomatic corps, and another Colin Wood, who was the EEC representative in the Gambia, if I can fully remember the name. And I told them clearly, I asked them, especially the EEC representative, what was the problem that you withdraw your citizens, you gave a travel ban for your citizens to come into the Gambia. Proudly he said, because the Gambia is on fire, so we will not allow our citizens to come into the country here. I said, very good. I got up, I called Nice the Director of um, Immigration. I said, from this second, you put them on personal non grata. For the simple reason that 
One, since the Gambia is on fire, it is better you people go back to your countries. Your people should know then the country which I come from is on fire. But your citizens will not stay away from Gambia and you stay in that, co uh, in that country which is on fire. It's not fair. So I put them on personal non grat. Barely four hours later, James Molly Scott, who was the diplomatic dean of the diplomatic corps at the same time, the high commissioner for Liberia in the Gambia, with Imam Abla, the Ratib, Imam Ratib of Banyun, Imam Ablai Job, they came, and two other dignitaries, I cannot remember exactly. They said, we have to, I have to stop that uh, personal non grata. I said, no. The condition here is very clear. They have to go, they leave the house in fire, they must go back to their countries and declare that the Gambia is on fire, that's why I come, I cannot stay there. And then they said, okay, we will come back to you. They went, after two hours, they came back, you are the residents, and then they said, we have asked our people to come back to the Gambia. I said, farewell, a good deal. This is one example. Thank you. The final question is, I would like to hear your suggestions for institutional reform as part of our Never Again campaign. Thank you. Okay. You, could, you could include this in your concluding remarks. Okay. Thank you, um, Commissioner Kinti. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner Kinti. Savali. Please. Um, on the 11th, 11, 11 okay. early in the morning, you made an announcement. Correct. Informing the general public that two. Um, some some soldiers lost their life as a result of foil coup, Correct. and it was in a fight. Actually, it was in the fight, um, you know, technically because the, these people were already captured. In fact, from Yundum to Mile Two, Mile Two to Fajar, and they were they were executed. Correct. Um, again. Normally, when people were well, less, even if they, you regard them as enemies, which is unfortunate, because people of the same country uh, should rather regard each other as rivals and not enemies, because maybe one time or the other, their differences will be resolved and they'll become one and the same. Correct. That should be the national spirit. Correct. Um, yes, um, I thought uh, they, they would have, they deserved as mentioned earlier on by the council or whatever, a more healthy, uh, humanly treatment even at the burial time. But that's not the point here. Why in the barracks uh -huh. and not in the forest where they were shot or given to the people or in a cemetery, which is, no, which is, the, which is the norm, is normal. It's very unusual to isolate few corpses and bury them in a special place, especially where people don't have easy access. We are both uh, actions n not concealing the truth about what transpired, one. And two, uh, I thought over the years, after this time, after you have aged so much and you've, you've learned a lot of, you've got a lot of experience and so on, uh, don't you think uh, if it were this time uh, you had g captured these people, you would have either tried them, uh, give them due process or whatever, rather than summarily executing them and being even indifferent about uh, their rights. Um, thirdly, mm -hmm. yes, those days you, you thought the Geneva Convention um, was a fallacy, you, you don't regard it at all. But again, after aging and after gathering a lot of experience at this time, after 20 years, 24 years, 25 years. Mm -hmm. How? What is your perception about and your regard for the convention? And in fact, if you have anything in that part of it, you may keep for your conclusions. Okay. I am very grateful to this uh, question. Actually, it's like um, you remove it from my mouth. Uh, I was going to address that to my, my dad here, Dr. Sise. Uh, in Mandinka, the way I said it yesterday, I would say it in Mandinka, I would not stand here or anywhere and say, Dr. Sise misunderstood me. No. 
but it's the way I put it yesterday. And I didn't mean the Geneva Convention is not a good instrument. That would be cheating myself. Because when I went into prison, after two months, three months, into my third month, I was visited by the Gambia, sorry, the International Committee of the Red Cross. And this was by the help of the Geneva Convention. And when I left the prison, I asked for asylum in Senegal. It was under the Geneva Convention. When I went to Germany, I asked for, for asylum. I was under the Geneva Convention. What I wanted to say was, is that during a battle between two forces, these laws are hardly respected. And that is where my, if I could put it correctly, that's what I wanted to say. But not that the Geneva Conventions were totally shit. Sorry for the, sorry for the language. Right? And I give an example. In 18, sorry, in 1602, in, in Geneva itself, the the, the, the Geneva city itself had tall walls, long walls, high walls, and the emperor of Savoy wanted to overtake this city. And when he came in, in the night with 2,000 personnel, machineries, they called them, they came with long ladders to try to scale the walls of this Geneva city. And from there, this incident is called Le Escarte. Every year, they celebrate it on the 12th of December. What happened, there was even a lady called um, Catherine Chele. They call her Mare Royam. She had 14 kids, and in this particular night, she was cooking soup for her kids. How people didn't come to understand why she took part and denied her kids this soup, this cauldron, big cauldron of soup, she looked because she was living up, and then she saw these soldiers trying to scale the, with the long ladders to scale the, the, the top, long walls or the high walls. She poured this soup on the soldiers trying to scale the wall. And then the alarm came. They rang the church bell, and then the inhabitants of this city took arms, and then they fought with these mercenaries. Out of these 2,000 mercenaries, they were able to kill 54 on the spot. They lost about 13 or 12, if I can fully remember the story. And then they also captured 13 of these mercenaries. Right in the morning, they hung all of them without any due process of law. But fine, this is 1602. When the Geneva Convention came in, in the 90s, 19, in the 19th, if I'm right, 1949, then this was already centuries ago. However, I'm not guaranteeing, sorry, I'm not trying to uh, defend what we did as not part of the Geneva Convention, no. But it's just to see, so, uh, to show that I now borrow my landed friend's uh, words, this mindset of the soldiers in battlefront. There you are not seeing anything but to cross your enemy. And this is where our problem is when we are in battle these rules and regulations in the Geneva Convention, hardly they are respected, if I had expressed it properly. Uh, what, what I want to say is, at this, uh, whether after all the years elapsed, okay. if you were brought back to do the same thing, but with, the same, with your this age and experience, would you have paid heed to that part as war prisoners and you take them to court, and take due process, or would you still maintain that? Even well, you will summarily execute them because you, you that's what I'm saying. Okay, I said, yeah. to answer your question directly, I would not execute them because I have learned my lesson, I've become matured. Then I was 27 years old, I had nothing to prove, but I felt I had something to prove. Meaning, I was a soldier, I was an officer, I had soldiers under my command, and it was my duty at that particular point to see that they come home alive and safe. That was what I had wanted to prove, but anybody can say there was nothing to be proved. Feel like maybe my landed man would say, no, you had nothing to prove, and I would quite agree with him. If that date were to be brought today, I would, have, I would act in a different way, more maturely and more humanly. Yeah, and what about the suggestion that you are concealing the truth from the public, um, which uh, probably today you may have regretted, if it were today, what are you going to do? Like one, bury all of them 
in the in the camp so that people cannot access the uh, the graves for so many years mm -hmm. because of course if people if it was in the forest and popularly known some of these people would have been um, exhumed earlier than this time, this time correct you know taken by their people or whatever of course it was also it was also going to be a scandal right correct that uh, on the whole you have summarily killed these people in the forest and buried them Correct. But that's why up to 25 years today, it was very difficult to access them, to have uh, determine their fate um, uh, in, and so on, and put it on spotlight. Also the radio announcement, you could have simply said, well, we overcome them, captured them, executed them. In the beginning they were two, later six were taken. A, you know, a true story that happened. Probably that also may suggest that you are concealing the truth. That indicates some amount of, uh, some level of regret mm -hmm. or inconvenience or whatever you may interpret it. But I'm saying as at now, if it was this moment, we are you going to tell the truth to the people? Or in fact, you would not have gone that far. You would have uh, arrested them and, 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 and go the right way. Actually, if you were today, it would have been a different issue today. I would have acted maturely. However, I, wanted, I would like to say, for those of them who were arrested, and part of them were executed, were the ringleaders who were executed. The rest were taken before a court martial. But, as I said, if it were today, with my maturity and my wisdom, thank God, I would have definitely behaved like a matured person. Without uh, emotion or anger. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Savali, for that um, uh, response. And there's only two days. It's too uh, quick to say quintessential Sana Savali, Frank Kondo, your re response um, on the importance of the Geneva Conventions. <laughs> you realize that something had happened. Perhaps uh, you misspoken one or two things, but you came back, and that's where quintessentialism cuts in and uh, uh, clarified it. Very helpful indeed. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Uh, Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Jones, thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Savary, for your detailed testimony over the past two days. Um, <clears throat> beyond just identifying the violations that happened within the 22-year period that we're looking at, we're also trying to identify what were some of the institutional lapses um, so, so ch such that um, we won't return to the 22-year period that existed at the time, um, most especially um, a coup d'etat. Um, in your testimony yesterday, you did mention that um, whilst you were planning the coup, um, on the 21st of July in particular, you were the one who went to get the weapons from the <coughs> barracks. And you kept these weapons with you even after you returned from the airport, and this went unnoticed. Um, I just want to understand what what entailed at the time to the point where it went unnoticed that such amount of weapons were out of the barracks. In terms of quantity, how many weapons are we talking about? And what was the process? I think um, other soldiers or other witnesses here have explained there was some kind of a logbook where they were able to record um, whoever is, whoever is um, removing a weapon or taking out, signing, signing out for the weapons that they were taking. But could you explain, I just want to understand in more detail how that went on notice to the point that you were able to conclude and went ahead with your plans on July 22nd. Okay, thank you. As I said, in preparation and planning for a coup, it takes a lot of courage, um, secrecy, so to say. And out of the secrecy, you are able to do many things that are unnoticed. And removing these weapons from the armory was possible because, one, I had the storekeeper on my side. Two, I knew every weapon where they were placed inside the armory. So it was easy to go there, pick them, go out, like a small rat inside a house. So does this therefore mean that the storekeeper knew that they still were not returned back? They were not returned back. Because these weapons were not our personal weapons that we use every day. If they were those type of weapons, that like the AK-47, individual personal weapons, they would have been noticed. Thank you for that answer. Um, I asked a few questions regarding okay. November 11th. Okay. Um, 
some of the widows of um, the fallen soldiers that came to the commission testified that following the deaths of their husband, or in fact the night of um, November 11th, that some soldiers visited their homes and some of them were taken in for questioning. Um, could you please tell the commission who gave the orders to visit those widows um, in their residences the night of the um, execution? As far as I'm concerned, to my knowledge, I have never heard it. This is the first time I heard that uh, soldiers had visited the fallen soldiers' families. Okay, um, you did say that the July 22nd coup was justified for various factors that you detailed out yesterday, but um, you referred to the November 11 coup as a treason. What's the difference between these two coups? They are both treason. They are both like, if I would explain, like on Tobaski Day, the way we slaughter our arms, we cut the jugular vein of the ship. It is treason is just like that to the state. The difference here between 22nd July and our uh, 22nd July and 11th, 10th November is that ours was a successful coup, theirs was a failed coup. That's the only difference. Okay, um, one more question. Okay. Um, you had said that the initial plan of the junta, the council, was to stay in power for six months. Certainly but correct. then this eventually changed. What are some of the factors that you think led to um, Jamez changing desire to extend beyond the six-month mandate that you guys initially agreed to? There we will come to the collective. I am not quickly trying to throw more on everybody, but this were the part of the individual and collective failures. I will, not come, I will not say the institutional failures, but these were outside the institutions, they were individual. Because I learned first, as I said, when Baba Job came, Sondau, Jobate, and Bari, to try to talk me out to accept forming a youth organization, this 22nd July youth movement. I learned similar approaches were made, especially to Suguta and Burfoot. And from there, even before my arrest, delegations <coughs> had approached us to extend our stay in power, particularly Brufood and Sabiji. And later I come to understand, whilst I was in the prison in 96, that to say it in Mandinka or in Wolof, Suguta and Brufood, Nyongembajaya Prumu, Simit uniform be Mutahau as a civilian candidate for the presidency. So in short, it was external forces or external pressure. Exactly. Okay. Um, finally, um, we've also had some witnesses, one of whom was um, the former Minister of Agriculture at the time, OJ Jalo, Correct. who said, um, who explained their, o their own ordeal as well during that time, and in particular mentioned that you visited him four times to arrest him. So I would like in your final remarks, since you had the opportunity to apologize to some of um, the victims yesterday, if you could also just apologize to OJ and the crew or the other members that were arrested at that time as well. To OJ and all the PP ministers who were manhandled by myself and my guards, I said wholeheartedly, I am very sorry, deeply sorry, and I regret the incidents who have happened. Thank you. This is appreciated. Thank you. Thank Chair. you very much. Thank you, my Commissioner Imam Jalo. You have the floor. Imam Hussein Jalo, witness. You found a note inside Barrow's pocket. Correct. Indicating names of people who are involved in an attempted coup. Correct. Did you and your group ever ascertain whether actually that list was written by Barrow? or was not planted in his pocket for the purpose of carrying you out, carrying out the intentions to wipe out 11 Gambian lives unnecessarily? That's the first question. Okay. Do I come in? Yeah. Okay. To ascertain or not to ascertain here, we have not done that, but personally, I am the one who found this book in his map pocket. Whether he was the one who wrote it or not, I did not ascertain that. But for me, it was enough, the content of the, the, in the book was enough for me to know what plan they had against us. Thank you. My question is, Please. 
What advice would you give to young army officers presently serving against toppling a legal government in view of all the experiences you have gone through and what has happened to this nation for the last 22 years? Thank you. To the military or the, the security services in the country, I am saying do not fall on the track we fell. Fine, if you look at any issue, there are two sides to a story. If we had failed in our duties as officers and men of the Gambian National Army, the state also had failed. But here, this is not the defense I'm putting forward. You have asked me to talk to the, what advice I would give to the armed forces. I am saying, let us stay in the barracks. If you have any problem, as we did before, try to find out where to address those issues. There are officers also I would advise, please, for God and heaven's sake, for the sake of our nation, take the complaints from the junior officers, the men, and forward it to the right chain of command, and make sure that it is not only enough to forward their complaints, but also to make sure that these are followed until solutions are made out of it. Thank you. Before we give you the opportunity uh, to um, to, to make your concluding remarks, um, Mr. Sabali, uh, Commissioner Carr has indicated that he left out um, two short questions. I hope you okay. make them short. We'll come to you. Uh, oh, Bishop, you have the floor. You want to ask for the floor as well. Um, Commissioner Carr, can you hold off a little bit uh, since you had the opportunity earlier? Um, Bishop, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Mr. Sana Bairo Sabali. Please. Uh, may I ask, what is the role of the military in a country? Do I come in? Yes, the role of the military in the country is the defense of the state. The primary function of the military is to defend the inter territorial integrity of the country and to uphold the standards of the constitution. And you would agree with me not to involve themselves in governance? It depends on, Bishop, from where you look at it. It's uh, <laughs> quite an answer. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Commissioner Kai, you have the floor, please. Uh, do you want me to delve more on that answer, please? Well, um, actually, you did not answer the question. Okay. Um, Can you pose the question, please, again? I said, do you agree with me okay. that since the role of a military is to uh, defend uh, the state and, uh, and property, that you are not supposed to be involved in governance of the country? Okay. Before, my understanding was that we were to uphold the constitution and the total integrity of the country, but I am made to understand now that the army have to stay completely out of politics, and I hold that line correct. And thank you for your advice. And thank you, Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I left out two questions, and the okay, first please. is is in relation to some of the committees we have in the commission. Um, what happened to the two ladies um, that you mentioned were tortured, and did they develop any subsequent complications out of that? Yeah, one to this day could not conceive any baby, and the other one could never go to bed with a man. Thank you. Um, the second is in relation to the ban that the junta imposed on political activities at the time. What informed it? Sorry, please. The ban on political parties at the time. When you took over, you imposed a ban on political parties. I'd like to know what informed that, that what, decision. What formed that all? Sorry? I don't get your question clearly, please. Uh, when the junta took over, Forgive me. there was a ban on political parties. Right. Yes. I would like to know what informed that decision. Thank Actually, you. we wanted to first consolidate ourselves, and we felt if we had let the political parties at free will, there was going to be a lot of disturbance in the administration of the country. So as such, 
we gave ourselves some time to say, okay, we banned the po activities of the po political parties until such a time that we felt the waters have come down, then we could open the gate so that all political parties can take part. But as I said, for me, this is not going to come into play because we are going to hand over in six months. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Imam C. You have the floor. Yo, Minam Heti. Hakule Marano Be Fajara. Hey. Imam. 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 Uh, could you allow for the interpreters to take position before you proceed, please? Imam Danglai Nyan ga har interpreter in Ujel Sen Plas. So kadefe nyu muna dega lenga ilatje. Mele fogna parena nyu munga continue. Marano Be Fajara. Dido Marano Be Ton. The two who were killed in Fajara. Nega dulo me de yundum. When you brought them in yundum. Did you bury them in the same day or you buried them when you buried them? Or it, 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 it happened in the same day? The same day. We buried them in, buried them in the same day. The one you took at the forest, what time did you take them at the forest? Was it in the morning or in the afternoon? In the afternoon. In the afternoon. In the afternoon. Then, it was not yet Maghrib prayers. The second time, the second time, you did not even mention who and who, who uh, killed what and who and who. When you give the order, did you, you yourself did you uh, suit or you did you not suit? I should. I should. I'm praising you. For you to, accept, to come and testify. And you, and you also accept what you have committed. You did not hide anything. You did not deny anything. I am praising you on that. The people that you offended, their relatives. What, what, do, what is your intention in that? I will not be afraid of any uh, any human being, and I will not hide on any human being. When I stand here, I, I swear to the Holy Quran. I will only speak the truth. And I speak the truth. If I lie here. If you people, you the commissioner, you, you do not know the truth. Allah the Almighty who, who is seen us. And who, who created us. He knows the truth. Allah himself has said it in his Quran. The same goes on. Meaning... Meaning don't hide the truth and the truth that you know is a, is a lie. That is, do not conceal the truth, do, do not, not cover the truth, the truth with lies with or lies. falsehood while you know what, it, what the truth is. Love. Do not conceal the truth or cover the truth with falsehood when you know what the truth is. Don't see how to carry on, chagal mum, 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 Hope when you return back to the country, hope it did not give you any difficulty outside world. When I was coming back to this country, I did not think of anything. I, the only thing I have in mind is that I'm coming to this country to give my testimonies. If I, did, if I go back or I did not go back, the, all it is, uh, I will see that it is the... Uh, what I'm asking is that when you went out, when you went on exile, hope you do not have any difficulties outside. Even in your, in your compound, you have difficulties rather than go if you go out. Like the English said, there's no place like home. When your compound is better than uh, when you go out. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have them, um, uh, we will give, now give you the opportunity to make your concluding remarks. And you can do it as counsel indicated earlier okay. in uh, the local languages that you can speak in. Please proceed. Gambe Mandinko, Anaka Moilal, 
Smamboki Wolofi. Hello. Could you Sorry. allow the interpreters to uh, position themselves, please? Go ahead, please. Mbadi Mandinka lana kamoilal. Ko fellow Mandinka and those who can speak Mandinka. I ngala chentu baake. Great thanks to the Almighty God. And nga Gambia dingol chentu baake. And I'm expressing my sincere thanks to the Gambians. And Gambia masa kunda mbe siri nsa inti. And the present Gambia government. Pasi nlapta mimi mfola chenting. Because what I want to say now. Since I came out of prisons and I went out of this country, because I love this country because of that, I've never sat down during the day or a night, just like I was a mad person before. I was planning everything to come back into this country and get and, 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 and remove Yaya Jame from power. But the day I had that, I, I, I planned to do that, that's the day I stopped that when President Barrow took over the country. That's the day I stopped planning to come and remove Yaya. If I name names today, people will start speculating. So many people in the diaspora were talking, beating their chests. We, dis we removed Jame from the government. They tried something. They, everybody tried something. But there were many who were on the ground. They didn't come out into the open. Those who were beating their chests, their love for this country was not more than those who were on the ground. And today I will name two people among Gambians. If I name these two people, just to show, we never sat down uh, complacently. Uh, Suleiman Dau. Suleiman Dau. He, he never sat down or he never rested. I will call another one, Ibrahim Asilla, he is the Minister of Information presently. Ahmad Ba, Minister of, uh, I, don't, I don't know which ministry he has now. Ahmad Ba, I cannot say which ministry he is heading. But I will raise of my hand. Anyone who beats his chest. To show that I'm a, a true Gambian, you cannot be more than these three people I named. So I will say that it is everybody's effort that removed Jame from this country. And I'm coming back to the army. What I am begging from the soldiers, I alto Allah barak solto. Stay in your barracks. Don't say Sana and Co did this, they, they succeeded and I will also do it. Don't do that. Things can look alike but they are different. I want to say it in Wolof. What I said in Mandinka. So many people, when Jame left this government, they were beating their chests saying that we removed Jame from power. And when, where they were was very far from the Gambia. But I can say they were in the Gambia too. Because Jame has gone. Everybody will say that it is me who removed Jame. But there were people who were on the ground. What they were doing is known to only God. This is why I said Suleiman Dau. Ahmad Ba. Ibrahim Asilla. 
Nous sommes tous les deux en train de faire des choses. Nous sommes tous les deux en train de faire des choses. Nous sommes tous les deux en train de faire des choses. They went to many places to diplomats in different countries. down on Jame. So that they can have something to, re, to, to do which will remove Jame here. If I, if I see people beating their chest saying that I, I, I removed Jame from the Gambia, I will just laugh and keep quiet. Gambia Banco, this country, this Gambia, it belongs to all of us. But me something I can in the Bible. Just as something did in the Bible, if we remove the pillars from the house, it will come down. So this TRRC, follow, follow, follow. I should be the most happy man about it. Because these 22-25 years, There is no stick which people didn't take and beat me with. They said everything about me. They go even to my family. There is nothing that they didn't tell my family. There is nothing they didn't write in this internet. But I know I didn't want to talk until a day like today. Until a carola be come until a yamul yakum. Well, I'm going testimony day. On my side, it looks like the day of confession or the day of testimony. Since this TRRC started, maybe many people will not know, but I want to clarify it here. I started planning to come to the Gambia. But the passport I was having Of course, I had a problem in this country. I, I fled the country. I can go to every place except the Gambia. That's why I was unable to come the time I wanted to come. Until when God's time came on Saturday, I thank the Gambian embassy and staff for I thank the Gambian people, I thank the Gambian embassy, the ambassador and his staff. And in uh, na brother lead council Tentungajai. Plus my brother, the lead council, I want to thank him. And in the whole TRRC. And the whole TRRC. Because he cannot go it alone. We talked on the telephone. Gambia. I said I'm coming to the Gambia. There, there are many people friends and the like and the family mall and some family members who said no 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 Gambia is a no-go place for you. I said okay I won't go. Tell the TRRC that I want to talk to them through Skype. But even the day I was leaving Dakar to come to the Gambia, my, one of my friends was aware of it. Because he left Dakar and came to the Gambia on Friday. He went back to the Dakar on Mon back to Dakar on Monday. What? That Monday morning was the day I left and came to the Gambia. When I told him that I'm going to the Gambia, he opened his eyes on me just like something terrible has happened. I told him, I'm going to the Gambia. I'm not going there to tell them the truth. But I will tell them the side of my story. Gambians can weigh it for themselves and remove the truth from lies. That's why I am here. Because, because we were in darkness within these 25 years. This is why Commissioner Kinte said we hid things. Yes, it's true. Because we didn't open our we didn't open our mouths to clarify things. But me myself alone. 
Kwa nga internet oto nini karol siyata kuma kongol siyata bari nga nda muto. Just as I said, there were so many things written on the internet, questions and so on, but I kept quiet all along. Nga nda muto? I kept my mouth shut for until a day like today. TRRC. So I will say at this point that TRRC. I will tell the whole Gambians that. Anyone who was a soldier. Whatever you go through. Before TRRC will come for you. Yes, singo wuli denken denken yena futela. Come yourself to the TRRC and Ye, show yourself. Yelungo dile la. They will give you a day. Yet watu dile la. They will give you time. Yela call for yalo nyame. You come and say the, and tell them the truth. How you know the truth? It will be tony abon la fanya konole. They will be able to uh, the, 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 know the truth from the from lies. Aski nina ata jenga fanya double double nga lanyo kanga. If I come here and tell lies. Tomando atol talon na maybe they will not know it but the almighty god who created me abalon nilan will know and aba funti la bantel and so one day god will reveal it na principal mu neti jang my principal here is wala nyinti ko yes this nsina no jani nga fania double double i can come here and tell lies but ndam male be nyinge bang but I was not alone there. Oto minu ben mfe nyola ibina jene tonyafo. Those who were with me will also come here and they will tell the truth. Sinin sama tomorrow. Nte be kala nyadi le. But ama how am I going to look at the Gambian people? How or how am I going to live here? Ningko hani alama walanse ala soki. If I say God doesn't know that, ah well, I'm 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 doing something against God. But for kuma falam drong. But it's just to say a word, say something. Mbeki baro minki la sa mbanta. The news I want to send out now. I am sending it to Yankuba Ture. I'm sending this news to Yankuba Ture. Edward Singate. Edward Singate. And Yaya Jame. And Yaya Jame. Laftangye Dane Aninkila. I want to beg them for God's sake. Ye Fero Bekata. Let them plan by all means. Ibe Daoda. Wherever they are. Ye Fero Katayna TRRC. Let them try and come and face the TRRC. There's nothing wrong in it. Ni tena bi yetonya folom. If there is anything wrong, just come and tell the truth. Katonya fonyoe. Let's tell each other the truth. Banko eta nyato. The country can move forward. Ngabu dimbaule ngokono. So that we can come out of the fire that we were in. Banko dole TRC kile. Some countries also held the TRRC like this. Rwanda. Rwanda, South Africa, South Africa, Liberia and Dalajang, Liberia just near us, Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, and I'm me from Canada for Nigeria. And not long ago, Canada, Canada, Canada did it. And I'm I am me content in Bahrain. And I'm very happy. Because the new all the TRC composition of Gibe. Because if you look at their composition of the TRRC, the bank didn't only bank didn't do all the budget sharing. Their citizens were mixed with others or with mixed with for with foreigners. But in TRRC, but this TRRC, I'm from all the bank didn't only is pure Gambian. It's purely Gambian affair. What I need to go in the new culture understand now. That means that we will understand each other's culture. Ngana saim fangalo kuto. I'll come to myself now. Gambia mumembal hakedani la. The whole Gambia, I'm appealing to you. Kamo hakedani. To appeal to you and beg. Karafulalom. Two things. Ye meng iboita meng kasida. The people you offended. Wolfanam fa ingi isengi sotno isondo mo kono kayam fota. So that they will have the forgiveness in their hearts. Tonya lom. No, it is true. Momo se ulno je na konye kosa na idabiti. Anybody can get up here and say, "Sala, shut up." You need to remind them all, Kang. The hardship you you meted on the people, Molmin Fata, those who died, Kafoko Aliyam Funye Ote Nati Nola. Because to stand here and say, "Please forgive me," will not bring those people back. Al Tonya Alam. But it is true. Nyawa nya nsemim fono le njiko ngamu kedani. Anyhow, what I can say is, I'm appealing to you. I'm begging you, people. Na nyato kato aninna soja romi beng mbulunu. When I was leading and the soldiers who were following me, whatever we did wrong, and it is not the right thing to do, I'm begging all of you, please, I'm begging for forgiveness in my name and those who were following me. Just as I said, I was a kid or i was a child or a young person in those days i i was not experienced 
Bitilo alhamdulillah but today i thank god nsita alfa ya palaso to i have reached an elder's position polingintiko ngakul bo nyotole that it means that i have i now know what is good and what is wrong ningsa soto no if i can have it my way ah uh, november 10 november 11 november 10 and november 11 minu fata those who died mbulol kono in our hands ila family yol ni senyoje uh, I would like to see their families. To, to, to appeal to them and beg them for forgiveness. I come back to the constitutional, uh, sorry, the institutional failure of the country. I come back to the. Yo, now I want to talk in English, please. Okay, I come now to the institutional failures of our country on or before the 22nd July 1994. As we all say, at the time we had corruption to our necks, we were swimming in corruption. It was nothing but everybody was for him or herself. And this were some of the main roads that we rode on to get to where we had to go to on the 22nd July to take over the reins of the country from the former ruling PP party. Uh, my little advice, I'm still young among elders here. If you are within the elders, you must not raise your voice for the elders know better than you. However, since I have the opportunity to be asked what I would uh, advise to the public, I take this opportunity to say what I want to say now. Uh, in this institution, we have a culture where if everything is going right, I am responsible. When something goes wrong, somebody is responsible. In government, I had personally, I never rested. I give an example one day. I went to the clinic in Suguta. It was around 6, 7 in the evening. It was my normal patrol control. I go alone. I went to this clinic. I found the nurse on duty was not there. I asked the watchman, where is the nurse? The watchman immediately wanted to beat me. And I explained to him, I was the vice chairman, and then I wanted to see the nurse on duty. He said in Mandinko, Atatala Kamba no lea. Nka in Mandinko hola, Atata Mintole, Aka Atatala Kamba no lea. Nka isen Samba no ye bang, Akonyeko, Manjelong. Nka Akonyeman Samba no ye bimbe Sambalane. I told her, if you don't take me to the place, I will take you. Nibi Tanya Lankatadame. I will go with you to where I'm going to. And he said, he said to me, I know that place. So he got into the vehicle and uh, we left. We took left and right turns until we got to the compound. When we arrived, we knocked at the door. The man came out. He stood and asked me, what are you doing here? I said to him, I am asking for the nurse who is on duty at the hospital. He said to me, if you do not leave this place, I'm going to do something to you. I said to him, whatever you will do, you will do, but I have come here to... Uh, Pick the nurse. He took, he took a position, wanted to hit me, and I announced to him that I was the vice uh, chairman, Sabali. I think at the time the nurse heard my voice, and she came out running. I said to her, get into the vehicle, and she got into the vehicle, and so we left with the, with the uh, watchman. We got back to the clinic. As we got to the clinic, we found uh, the women. Ladies were in labor. labor. We found women in labor. They were assisting each other. Minister of Health Kumandi. That was the day that I called the Minister of Health. Fatima Tambajanjalo. Fatima Tambajanjalo. Sorry, Fatima Jalo Tambajan. Fatima Jalo Tambajan. I said I'm at Sukuta Clinic. Uh, I told her to come to the Sukuta Clinic. Her husband said to me, why would you be calling my wife this time of the night? And I said to him, well, uh, this is part of our work. Uh, when Fatima arrived, it coincided at the time when this woman was assisted and she had already given birth. And she had a, a baby boy. 
and they named him after me. Another incident at the Serakunda Hospital, for example. Incident of Anakita Serakunda Clinic Auto. Another incident happened at the Serakunda Clinic. Minupata Yalatakunda Sabiji. We once left Latakunda Sabiji. Minupata Latakunda Sabiji. Those that got uh, left uh, came from Latakunda Sabiji. I think everyone would know Master Jata. Uh, how his uh, wife was brought to the clinic. Five o'clock. From morning time up, up till five o'clock. Musobe Timoto. The woman was in labor. No sobe sirim bantebe atayala. The nurses were outside brewing attire. Nata ndunta kontenga musa yata tara sirim ayak bulol akung muta bulol abulol kono. I arrived, went inside, and I found Master Jata. His head was buried in his hands. Malon no wato katel masa jata tere. At the time, I did not know him to be Master Jata. Ngano so nininka? I asked the nurse. Ate masa jata from follow janjanta. Master Jata himself was the one who was. Angry. Akonyeko has an sirim banta. He said to me, uh, he's, she's out there sitting, seated outside. Akamunta nga nyininka question lako mi mune isi yang. It's like I asked him the question, what is your purpose of uh, being here? Akonyeko nga muso nari yang kabinin samanda for sign five o'clock iman songka aten. He said to me, I brought my wife here since morning up to five and uh, uh, she has not been attended to. Ntumne taula nyaman tata bunda dato. I turned and returned back to the door. I asked for the nurse. Those that were seated brewing attire, they all scattered. I held her, brought her inside and told her to assist the women. Not a minister of health command again. I then called the minister of health again. Those two nurses, I requested that they be transferred to the provinces. Now I come to my own situation in the office. To show that there were institutional failures along lines. My own permanent secretary, sorry, my own secretary at the president's, vice president's office, uh, Ablai, sorry, Sehu SR Njai, Aketa Arabolumuliti, three people were supposed to travel to Dakar, Nyantala Seminala. Mosa Banyantala Dakar Kata Karamulaji. This people came to me and, uh, and told me, Vice, we want you to borrow as a vehicle. I gave them a vehicle. They told me that they will be leaving the country tomorrow, Thursday. That Thursday, they left here and went to Dakar. On Friday. This Sehu Esar Njai, I list on that thing, you know. He brought a list for me. Akon ye vice gawal gawal nga sign bini ni nyo dem legi 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 ni suru suru akangola. He told me vice be quick and sign this. These people are the guys who left here. Ne 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 ne. Ako, I told he told me sign this paper vice quickly because these people are leaving right now to Dakar. Okay, ni mo le okay okay. He told me, sign this paper right away. These people are supposed to leave here right now and go to Dakar. They are supposed to travel by Senegal Air. If they are here up to 12 o'clock, the flight, they will miss the flight. He didn't know that those people had already left the day before. When I took the list from him, I saw these three names. Apart from those three names, they added other names there until it became 16 names. Uh, everything together. If you look at it at that time, these three people, their podium, their hotel bills, all added together. Amount of behind twenty thousand. It was below twenty thousand dollars. But list of men nata. But the list they brought. It was four million plus. It was four. Uh, it was four million plus. Akong ole sign. He wants me to sign that document. Alal de marokang. With the help of God. I saw that uh, uh, mistake. Nga MB wada commandi the secretary general. I called MB wada the then secretary general. A meeting o commandi. I called for a meeting. Nga Sehu Sise Kumandi, who was the chairman of the PSC. I called Sehu Sise, who was the chairman of the PSC. I showed him this problem. They looked, they looked at it on the PSC laws. 
Sisa Konyeko, dismissal is the case. Sisa told me that these people should be dismissed. Tumando mo wato sita siyata, but when I don't have enough time. When we come to this, um, these institutional failures, if we come to the institutional failures, mm -hmm. everybody was taking part and everybody was part and parcel of these institutional failures. Yeah, I have my reason. And it is because everybody was there for himself or herself, we failed to make the checks and balances we were supposed to make. It, is even, it was even like that in the military, in the army. People don't respect the institutional institutions of the state. We take them to be nothing but only belonging to this government. And if I may ask, who is this government? Are we not the government? Therefore, let us respect the time to work. When I was there as vice chairman, I made sure that everybody was at work from 8 o'clock to 1600 hours. And I had a proverb, I change it. People say, you can force a horse to the river, but you cannot force it to drink. I change it. I will not force the horse to the river, but if you are at the river, you will drink. <laughs> right. Trace Drame can attest to that. I once went around and I found 17 ladies, all our secretaries, on one typewriter. Then we didn't have computers in the government, if there were maybe very few. And I asked them, what is your job here? I am secretary. And you, secretary. And you, secretary. And we came to find out all these 17 ladies, they were transferred to the provinces for over four years. They all refused to go because maybe Sana is my uncle, Sana is my brother, Sana is my, Demba is my father. I told Tres Drame, bring me a paper and a pen. Because we had a list of where we had shortages of secretaries. I closed my eyes, I took the pen, I put it on one name, and one name for a school, for example, until we finished these 17 people, uh, ladies. We left only one there who was supposed to be Ngamintra at the typewriter remain. The one we that we found at the typewriter, we allowed it to remain. And the rest were transferred immediately. And one was there, she was my sister, so to say, extended family. The father is from Lamen. The family is from Lamen. But she has ever refused to go on postings beyond Serakunda. He said even Lamen was a bush town. And I have no doubt if we all would feel the same way, we would not go to, to the provinces for posting because the, the province is a bush. I come from Kasakunda. I only see the moonlight. I am appealing to the state. I'm appealing to everybody, every Gambian. Let us respect ourselves in work. Let us see that we go to work, we deliver the work. The European countries are not better than us. They came from a point and they are today developed. We call them developed countries. We are underdeveloped countries. That is total false. We can be developed as they are. The government is not foreigners. In the government are Gambians. Let us help each other to get to where we want to get to. Our past should not be our future. We cannot change our past, but we can change the future. And that we need together. The Gambit we have it today, what we need is Gambian unity, forgiveness, but before the forgiveness, confession to the realities of our mistakes, our misdeeds, and then we forge ahead for a reconciliation and we look for a better future. Let us not let a dark past cloud a brighter future. And to the journalists, I am not anti-journalism. I am only anti-insincere journalism. Let us give the information as how it is. If you are privy to information before you publish it, please find out, investigate. It is not wrong to wait for two, three days to get to the core of the information you're going to deliver to the people. Because you are our people who will give us the information. You are there to teach us, to direct us, but also to warn us. Give us the correct information. I thank you all, fellow Gambians. I am sorry. I am sorry. I am sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sabali, for those my closing remarks. And again, for your candor and uh, for the uh, time that you have taken as a brave man to come back to country that had um, uh, 
difficult past with you. Very few people do that. Very few people want to face the truth. We especially, as I said, I keep on repeating the word candor. But we thank you enormously for, for your testimony and uh, for coming to help this uh, commission to carry out its mandate as um, uh, given to it by the National Assembly. I also would want to thank um, the people who made great efforts to facilitate your appearance summer here. Mm. The Inspector General of Police, Please. the Attorney General's Office, the in investigators here, the legal team, and the entire Secretariat mm -hmm. had all worked um, uh, tremendously to make sure that uh, your travel here is uh, arranged them uh, properly and uh, adequately. I want to thank them all very much. This would bring us some... Uh, uh, Council, you wanted to say something before I uh, uh, proceed there? Please, go ahead. Uh, yes. I am just pleased to announce uh, that uh, we have just received information uh, from... Uh, I'll just read the information as it is received. So. Uh, it is, please, can you kindly tell Commissioner Sise and Esafal that I, Matisala, the late Abdullah Bas wife, has forgiven wholeheartedly uh, for his honesty and truthfulness for the crime he committed. I think, Mr. Chair, you may wish to comment on that. I think it is uh, quite laudable that uh, this family is willing to forgive even without meeting with uh, Mr. Sabali. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's a very good development. This is what uh, we think we know ourselves, uh, Gambians. <laughs> Tolerant, forgiving, and uh, understanding. Very difficult pass, very difficult time for some countries and societies around the world to go over that. But it's a reconciliation thing. Uh, I would ask the chairman of the Reconciliations Committee to perhaps I must say a few words here and then thank them as well. Imam, um, you have the floor, please. Imam Jalo. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, this message is very important for all of us. But more important for our brother here, who has come here to say all that he did and say it in the most noble way. It is as a result of this that this message has come to us. We congratulate you and we thank you. But for the other people who are still are behind, it is important that you come to this commission. Our intention is to heal, to forgive and to forget and so that it will never happen again. I entreat everybody who is involved, who has something to offer this commission, to come forward. And we are looking forward to meeting you. Mr. Sabali, yes. Ajarama. Albarka, uh, can I say something? I want to make an appeal. Uh, I would like to offer my services to the state, to the TRRC, Psycho Education, Psychotherapy, to my victims free of charge, if it is possible. But also, I want to appeal to the government of the Gambia, through this TRRC, uh, there is a project, it was a German project, I was running it. It was supposed to be meant for Senegal and the Gambia. But the moment I have to come to the commission, the project was stopped to come to the Gambia. And I felt it is unfair, but it belongs to the German state. They have their regulars, rules and regulations as to how they handle our international community in which Gambia belongs to. I am appealing to the government of the Gambia and the TRRC, please, for God and heaven's sake, the project Gambia needs it more than Senegal. If possible, I would make an appeal that the TRRC, Mr. Gambia government, as soon as possible, 
you also in turn meet the German government, that is the ministry responsible for international and international society about meaning working together in the international community and the GE set. You try to get this project to come to the Gambia as soon as possible. They just suspended it, but please talk to the government to help the Yemen government to bring this project to the Gambians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stabile, for that information. We will follow up um, uh, uh, on it. This brings us to the end of um, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. sorry for interrupting. Before you suspend uh, this session, I just wish to uh, say that Mr. Sabali came here voluntarily on the basis of assurances and undertakings that the Commission gave to him. He did not ask for immunity. He did not ask for anything. It is just his desire to come out and speak the truth and clear the air about what happened which motivated him to come because he believes that the Gambian people deserve to know the truth. Now we have heard Mr. Sabali. He has held up to his own side of the bargain. Now it is our responsibility as a people to also hold on to our bargain. He is a free man on his way to Gambia. He would be a free man going back to where he came from. I implore the general public to respect the arrangement we have with Mr. Sabali and to also respect his dignity as a human being. We cannot afford to go back to those years wherein we can castigate and lambast each other and say anything simply because one has fallen foul of the law. We have to respect the law and to respect his dignity. It is only that way we can move forward as a people. So I encourage everybody to give Mr. Sabali his peace of mind. The law will take its course at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council, for those wise words. Um, so I said, this brings us to the end of um, the proceedings summer today. The one well last well. point, Mr. Oops. Chair. <laughs> it's <laughs> becoming <laughs> habitual. Yeah. I just want to put in my exhibit. Uh, it, is, uh, it should be 0047. Uh, I'm sure you wouldn't have any problem with that. It's the investigative report. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. You have another interruption? <laughs> no, you, sir. Need, you probably need a lunch uh, interruption. But I uh, just want to thank you all. As I said, not just the end of uh, today's um, proceedings, but also the end of um, uh, the fourth session um, of um, uh, the, 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 the commission. Remember, the commission at uh, the plenary level here uh, holds these public hearings three weeks um, uh, in a row as we go on. The first one was in January 7th to the 31st, Second, February 11th, summer to the 28th. Third, 11th, March to 28th, March. And the fourth, 8th, April to the 25th, summer today. This brings us to the end of uh, that session. Uh, it's not that the commission would stop work. No, it's just the public hearings that uh, uh, we would um, uh, take a break um, from. And uh, uh, the work of the commission continues with uh, committee meetings, as well as outreach activities. So we are not closing shop. It's just um, uh, the public hearings that uh, we are suspending during the month of Ramadan. So we resume here uh, after Ramadan immediately on the 10th of January for the fifth summer session, which, Chair sorry, 10th of June. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> 10th of June, from uh, 10th Ramadan to the 27th of June, uh, where it would be the fifth session, and we would advise you uh, in a timely manner uh, what would uh, come up on the 10th of, um, of June. But again, thank you all enormously for the attention, and thank the public, really, for assisting us in this endeavor that's been given to us by the National Assembly. Thank you all very much. 
meeting is adjourned, and we'll see you January, uh, June, June 10. <laughs>